When you were growing up, what was the music you were listening to? What age? Well, let's say, you know, pre-teen. Teen. As a little kid, my introduction to rock and roll would have been in 1956 with Elvis Presley singing him on... Uh, uh, it was either Ed Sullivan or Milton Berle, the Dorsey Show, and I immediately became an Elvis fan, wanted to become a rock and roll star too, but I was only six, seven years old. But, uh, so that was my first introduction to rock and roll. Uh, my father would have a bar, so they had a jukebox, and every time the guy came uh, to change the records, he'd give me all the records they took out, so I just had piles and piles of records. I would notice that if I played certain people, like if I played the platters, my parents would go, oh, that's really nice. Hmm. That's, I don't know if that's good. If I put on a little Richard, a little Richard, get that off, you know? Uh, so I said, that must be the good stuff. So they said Elvis was a dope fiend, uh, so I figured that must have been good, you know? So, so yeah, Elvis was okay, that was good to listen to. A little Richard, they'd get mad about him, that was good. They'd, they'd hate Jerry Lee Lewis, so I knew that had to be good. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, a lot of people I've talked to, it's been that kind of a thing. If the parents like the music, you know there's a problem. Yeah, I mean, even though now I love the platters and things like that, too, and Fats Domino and all, all the things that they weren't minding. Was, uh, that's, that's pretty Then uh, just whatever was going on in rock and roll, whatever the best of stuff was. Well, I found the reason I'm, I'm leading up to is obviously... Can we stop for a second? Yeah. These women were talking just a little bit too loud. Can you just tell them to... Uh, I think she just left. I think it's going to be... A boisterous woman. A boisterous yeah. woman, yeah. <laughs> they always cut through everything else, the, their voices, yeah. Uh, All right. They should be seen and not heard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're still rolling. Okay. The reason I'm asking is, this is a set-up question. I, sure. I, I know what you're going to say. The whole scene. Give me a favor. Same can one. You just, just tell the hey, girl out there. Yeah, shut that dame up. Oh, you know thing. what? If you could close that door, would yeah. that ruin your clip? Well, yes, we've got a clip to the door. So, well, all right, let's do that. And, uh, if they would just take it down just a little yeah, bit, we'd be take it. I have to close it. Here we yeah, go. Tell them to take it down to 20 okay. decibels. Yeah, that's not going to happen. We know that. Yeah. We're not going to shut up. So, see if we can shut the door. It existed at the time, and you decided enough is enough. Okay. Uh, well, you know, in, in the late 60s with the drugs coming in, you got into the overindulgence of all these musicians. They'd be going on with long solos. They got away from the songs. Uh, rock and roll was always, the emphasis was always on songs. So this, in, in, in music in America was, was really bad at that point. Uh, you had some good things coming out of England still, uh, the glitter movement. You had the New York Dolls playing in New York. That was really, really good, really entertaining. Uh, you had Slade and Bowie and T-Rex uh, in England, and all that stuff was interesting. Uh, what about the Motown sound? Anything did that ever influence you all into that? Or? No, no. Uh, no. And uh, no, I mean, there's Smokey Robinson. All these people are really good, and Marvin Gaye, and yeah, all, all, all early stuff. But no, I was. Uh, I, yeah, I would listen to the stuff, but the influence. I, I, I'm white, and I have to look at the white rock and roll as this is what I can re relate to as far as me doing, you know. Uh, so, you know, I wasn't into blues. I was more into catchy pop songs, you know, with with a certain energy level. So that's more what I was into, you know. Yeah, and I... Uh, Something I feel like I could do it too, you know. But also, didn't you want to, like, just get rid of those influences and kind of, like, you know... I, I read somewhere that you didn't want to listen to like blues and this stuff and that stuff. You wanted to get you know, your sound right. clean. Right. You know, and it worked. But yeah, but you but you listen to all the great rock and roll, you know, from you know, as I said, Elvis, Ricky Nelson, Gene Vincent, you listen to all that stuff and all the great rock groups. But I don't play anything yet. I don't play guitar, so I'm not sitting there learning how to play their songs and getting influenced like that. It's just listening to it and just surrounding myself with great music all the time. The Kinks are another great group, uh, and you just listen to great songs all the time. Then you sit down and you know it's time to you're learning to play guitar and you're writing you're starting to write songs. So I'm not going to learn. I'm not going to write songs like like them because I don't know how to play their songs. You know. So then you just. You, you know, you know what it takes to write great songs. You know, it, uh, you need the, the great chorus. You need the great, you know. But you know the way music is now. I mean, it, I was talking to somebody the other day. I think that you know it's so the corporate and, and, and organized, like you were saying, <coughs> sound a certain way. Yeah. 
I think it's time for something else to happen. I mean, somebody out there. Well, I, I, don't, I just don't hear the. I don't hear the great songs. I don't. They don't. They, they seem to put too much into the songs, and uh, there's too many parts, and they talk about too many. You know, old songs have changed. Songs don't change. Songs are just the same. You know, so great songs. You, you'd be surprised in the '50s how many of these great rock and roll songs were covers of songs from the '20s and '30s, uh, and they were covers. You know, and, and I'm still learning that by looking at it through books, and I go, "Wow, this song was from the 1930s. I never knew this." You know, and, uh, and you see it all the time. Great songs are great songs, and there's a certain formula to the great song. You know, you have a good verse, you have the great chorus, you have, hopefully you have a strong bridge that might even be better. When the Beatles were able to put bridges that were even better than the choruses, and most people can't do that, but you just try to get that great chorus. You know, and you make sure it pops up enough times, and uh, you know. That's the key. Yeah, and just catchy songs, and you don't overdo it, and you're not too many things. And as a kid, I'd go see every band, I'd look at them and go, what are they doing right, what are they doing wrong, before I even play, and this thing, how they walked on the stage, and ah, they blew it already before they even walked on. And then try to make all these corrections later on when I'm in the Ramones, you know. Not to blow it, not to talk into the mic, just, uh, just turn the guitar up, and just, as soon as you hear the feedback from my guitar, you just scream out the count, lights are out, get the lights on, get on the boxes, lights go on. It's every little thing not to lose uh, or look weak up there in any way, you know? Did you have to work hard with the other guys to get the sound right? The show right? No, 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 no. They have to listen, you know? Uh, I would tell Didi, if your microphone don't work, just throw the mic stand down and yell out the count so you don't look for a moment of weakness, uh, you know? Just, just do it like that, so just grab it, throw it down, yell out the count. Yeah, just every, every little detail so that, you know, you don't look weak, you don't look like things are not working, or, you know, vulnerable, uh, you know, because you, you, you're, you know, you're supposed to be larger than life to the, the fans out there, you know. So uh, just, uh, just uh, a study of watching people and seeing what looks right and what don't look right, you know. You started before it was punk, right? There was no... Right, there's punk. no punk, right. And then when that label came out, were you happy with that or... Oh, uh, no, we didn't care. We didn't care. We didn't care. Uh, the only time it became a little bit of a problem was when all of a sudden they write things about punk and they just talked about the British scene and they, they were just talking about these bands and it was all negative stuff with the Sex Pistols and s spitting and uh, the, 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 their attitude and they were, uh, hated music. We wanted to keep rock and roll alive. Then we get lumped in on the negative, but when it became anything positive in the magazine, we'd be excluded. So we were excluded half the time when it would be good to be included, and we'd be included when it would be bad to be included. So it wasn't doing us any good at all, you know? Well, it seems that the, the, obviously the British punk thing like stole the thunder a little bit. Right. Well, yeah, it's easy, because, uh, you know, you have uh, the, the, the whole British scene is, is a punk thing, and you have Melody Maker write about it, and every kid in the country reads Melody Maker or the New Musical Express, put you on the cover, you're instantly big. In America, you couldn't do this, you know? So, <clears throat> who's going to do anything? No one's, no, one, no one's wanting to make the Ramones big, and you put you on the cover of Rock Scene magazine, still no one knows who the hell you are, you know? Not everyone reads the same thing. You have a little country. Right, it's a smaller country, and their media went... And there's only two stations on TV, there's only one radio station. It's, 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 it's so easy to break someone into being big. In America, it's, it's hard. Right. And like you said, besides New York and L.A., you got the Great Wasteland and stuff, you know. Right, you know, cool. and you had to break through every single city, you know, and even radio was a little different, and everyone was a little more independent of each other. You could be a huge band in Detroit, you remember this, with Grand Funk and MC5 and Bob Seger, and you could be a huge, huge in Detroit, and no one else around the rest of the country knows who you are, you know. You could be a huge Texas band, no one knows who you are, you know. I know, it is, it's very regionalized. So maybe that it was very possible. regionalized. Now it's gotten more not that way, but still, it, 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 not everyone also knows you, you know. Maybe that explains a little bit about the whole Liverpool thing, too. It's a smaller country, and they all yeah. gravitated to one spot. Right. And it worked. Right. Yeah. Right. And then bands, once it's happening, I'm saying about Seattle, once bands start, they, they move there just to become part of the scene, you know? Bands would come to New York, the bands from Ohio, I think the McCramps might have been maybe from Ohio. People would start coming into different areas. Talking Heads were obviously from Connecticut or Rhode Island or something like that. Then they'd be a New York band. 
no one would stay anywhere. Within a few hundred miles, you come to New York and you relocate. The Dead Boys were from uh, Ohio, too, Cleveland or Youngstown or something. So. You go where the scene is. Yeah. All right, cool. Good. Sure. That's great.